Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and thank you for signing up for this webinar, An Apple a Day, A Guide to Creating Change in Your School's Nutrition Curriculum. Uh, this webinar is being hosted by the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. We are a national nonprofit with more than 12,000 physician members and over 150,000 members total. We promote a plant-based diet to prevent and reverse chronic lifestyle diseases. We create educational resources for physicians and their patients, and one of our goals is to bring nutrition into medical education and practice. We're really excited to connect with you. Uh, before we get started, I want to go over a couple of housekeeping things, um, items. At the end of the webinar, we're going to do some Q&A, but throughout the presentation, you can send us your questions or comments by using the Q&A uh, question box at the bottom right hand of your screen. And uh, whatever you type there will go to the presenters and we'll answer them at the end of the presentation. We have uh, some polls going on. You can see in the middle right hand of your screen one of the questions uh, asking what, the rec what you think the recommended amount of nutrition education hours in undergraduate medical curriculum is. So if you haven't already entered your answer, please do and we will broadcast your results momentarily, and then we'll go over the uh, actual result, actual number um, in a moment. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, today in our presentation, our goals are to understand why nutrition education is important, to learn about current innovative nutrition education programs, learn how to bring plant-based nutrition education to your medical school, get to know the physician committee's resources, and set next steps for your school. Uh, I'm so thankful today to be joined by a few wonderful speakers. We have Dr. Jim Loomis, who is the medical director of the Barnard Medical Center, Joe Money, our medical student nutrition task force lead. We have Constance Lee, she's a fourth year medical student at Rowan, and myself, Francesca Valente, nutrition program specialist at the Physicians Committee. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us now. I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Dr. Loomis so we can get going. All right. Thank you very much, and thanks again for joining us this, uh, this afternoon and taking time out of your busy schedule. Um, what I want to talk to you about to lead off is, is why nutrition education is, is so important. So if you look at the amount of money that we spend per capita on healthcare, it's by far more than any other country in the world yet. We, we are 26, the U.S. is 26 in life expectancy. So we, we're spending all this money and what do we really, what kind of return on investment do we, we get for that? Well, I'm going to argue not a lot. Um, over two-thirds of the U.S. population is either overweight or obese. A third of U.S. population has high blood pressure, and a third of those people don't even know it, which puts them at risk for heart attack and stroke. One in four deaths in the U.S. are due to heart disease. One in three Americans either has diabetes or prediabetes, and I think you know, if you, if you want a, a, a poster child for a foodborne illness, I would argue that type 2 diabetes is really it. And, and um, this is really a tsunami of tragedy waiting to happen, um, both around healthcare care costs and, and, um, and disability related to diabetes. It's estimated that 7 out of 10 deaths in the U.S. are, are, are related to preventable uh, diet-related diseases. And the, the CDC estimates that 75 percent of trillion, the $2 trillion we spent on health care in the last year or so is related to preventable chronic disease. So it's a tremendous burden on our society from an economic standpoint. And we know that nutrition and lifestyle factors play a major role in maintaining healthy weight and preventing these chronic diseases like high blood pressure and diabetes and heart stroke, et cetera. 
So what all, you know, and what's the current state of, of education, nutritional education in med school? Well, the current, currently, uh, it's recommended, the answer to the question is 25 hours um, of, of nutrition education. That ends up being about 1% of the total curriculum in, in med school, about 1% of the time, uh, which I was going to argue is, is uh, not nearly enough. 71% of, of, of medical schools in the U.S. today failed to meet that program and meet that, meet that uh, recommendation, 25 hours, and about a third or so only offered 12, 12 hours or less. And even more important, 10% of programs don't offer any dedicated nutrition education. And I think that, you know, at least when I was in medical school, the other issue I think we have is that the kind of, when we talk about nutrition education, it, it, oftentimes it's around biochemistry, it's not around food, uh, which, which is um, um, another failing, I think, of the system. Upon graduation, half of medical students, more than half, feel that their nutrition education is inadequate. So how does this education translate into clinical practice? Uh, you know, when you graduate and you go out and you really start taking care of people. Well, it, it, it translates what you, what you might predict. Less than 25% of doctors include counseling on nutrition. And I think even more important is because we don't learn about nutrition, we don't learn about food, we don't think about food as medicine in our training, we end up with many of the same chronic medical problems that the general population has. 40% of, of male physicians are either overweight or obese, and about 35% of females. And the implications of that are when providers are provided, perceived to be overweight or obese, their patients have biased attitudes, which negatively affects their credibility and trust, and they're, they're, they have an inclination not to follow the medical advice they give, and more importantly, when when we when a physician doesn't lead a healthy lifestyle, when they don't eat right, they're going to be less inclined to talk to their patients about eating right. If they don't exercise, they're going to be less inclined to talk to their patients about exercise. If they smoke, they're not going to talk to their patients about smoking cessation. So it really, uh, when, when we, this starts way upstream when we don't learn about nutrition in medical school and we don't apply it to our, 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 our own lives, it affects us as individuals, but also our patients in, in a profound way. And until about five or six years ago, I was, in fact, guilty. Um, you know, I didn't learn anything about medical school. I, I graduated medical school a number of years ago, and, and I had to kind of self-educate, and, and I tried to think about the food pyramid and, a healthy diet to me was based around low-fat dairy and lean meat and, and fruits and vegetables, all in moderation. You know, I could have some ice cream and donuts and such, just not too much. And if you would have asked me five or six years ago if, if my diet was healthy, I would have said, sure, I don't eat that many cookies or eat that many donuts or that many cheeseburgers, which are all true statements. Um, the problem was, you know, Monday one of the nurses would bring cookies in the office, and Tuesday there's donuts in the doctor's lounge, and Wednesday I have a cheeseburger and french fries, and Thursday it's cake and ice cream. And so I perceive I'm eating healthy because I'm moderating my individual choices, but in aggregate my choices aren't very good. And, and I think many patients have this attitude when we, when we talk about eating in moderation. And the consequence of that is if you look at the way we talk about nutrition today, you know, it is it, – 65% of the calories come from highly refined grains and oils, 25% from, from uh, high unsaturated fat. Only about 12% of calories consumed today um, really come from the kinds of foods that, that are most helpful. And so I could get away with eating like this uh, if I exercise. And about five years ago, I tore my, the meniscus in my knee playing with my dog, and um, unfortunately, waited too long, to, waited a while to get surgery, didn't do the rehab, and I became a patient. Um, I gained a ton of weight, and at the age of 52, all of a sudden, uh, started to collect doctors. I ended up developing sleep apnea, which led to atrial fibrillation, and then I had you know, metabolic syndrome, high cholesterol. And my doctors treated me just like I treated my patients. You know, I got a sexy CPAP machine to wear for my for my uh, sleep apnea, and I 
got some antiarrhythmics for my AFib and I got a statin prescription for my, uh, for my cholesterol. No one ever talked to me about my diet. And, you know, it was increasingly frustrating as I, as I tried to kind of navigate the system. And one day I was laying on the couch watching TV and I came across this documentary, Forks Over Knives. And it was really the first time that, that I ever e it even crossed my mind to make this fundamental connection that food is, in fact, medicine. And, and, and what I've come to learn is, in fact, it is the most powerful medicine that I have to prescribe to my patients, way more powerful than, than any drugs. And as I started to explore around um, um, other resources, I discovered the Physicians Committee and 21 Day Kickstart and, and some of uh, Dr. Barnard's books. And I decided as an experiment to go on a plant-based diet for, 30, for three months and see what happens. And the results are really miraculous. I ended up losing um, 30 or 40 pounds, and my cholesterol went from 260 to 150, and my sleep apnea went away, and my allergies went away, and on and on. And almost two years to the day, I, I ended up finishing a, a, a half marathon. And, but, but again, you know, I never made this fundamental connection that food is medicine. This is how, I think this is how we think about food in our society. You know, heart attack with extra cheese, heart attack with bacon, but double packs, no pickles. Hey, where's my diabetes and large stroke? We eat this food, and then we have to go see the doctor to get treated for these kind of chronic diseases, which are directly related. So, so when I went on this plant-based diet, again, I lost weight. I ended up doing this half Ironman almost two days, two years to the day of going on a plant-based diet. And I think the most important thing I realized through this process about me personally and, and the way I practice medicine is, I, you know, I thought I was this fabulous um, health care provider, and, uh, but, but I wasn't. Uh, you know, I was really a sick care provider. Patients would come to me with high blood pressure, and I treated them just like I got treated. You know, I'd give them some, some, uh, some antihypertensives. And I might talk about diet in a superficial way, but it wasn't in a meaningful, actionable way. And they would come back, and the blood pressure pills would be great, uh, but now their cholesterol is high. So we would iterate that again. And, and so we waited. We, I, we would wait for people to get sick before we treat them. We allow them to accumulate the chronic disability that comes from the side effects of the drugs. The drugs are expensive. Uh, we allow you to walk around, get obese, and, and develop the consequences from that cancer and, and arthritis and, and such. Um, you know, wait for you to get cancer, cancer and we give you chemo. And that... The only way, and so when we practice medicine that way, what we end up doing is we can add years to your life, but we take away life out of, of our patients' years. We give them, again, these drugs that have side effects and such, and that there is another way. And what, what true health care really is, it's the ability to add years to our patients' lives, and our own lives, frankly, and, and sustain life in those years. And, and the only way you can really do this is focus on the root cause of disease and, and with diet arguably driving about 75 to 80% of, of, of our health, the other being uh, emotional health through sleep and stress and physical health through exercise. So, um, and, and arguably plant-based nutrition is, is, is the most healthful diet, not only for patients, but also I think when you think about the environmental consequences of, of, uh, of the food we eat and such as that. So um, hopefully that will give you a, a little bit of background on why I think this is so vitally important and it's something we really need to start to address because I don't think the healthcare system we have today is sustainable. It's not sustainable from a cost standpoint. It's, um, it, the way we eat food today is not sustainable from an environmental standpoint. And, and you all, as, as medical students, really uh, need to carry the torch forward as far as, as really fundamentally changing the way we think about health and healthcare and what it means to be healthful. Thank you. All right. Uh, well, thank you, Dr. Lerman. Um, and I'm going to, oh, so, sorry. My name is Jo. Um, I am here with the Physicians Committee for a little bit of time. I'll be starting medical school this fall, so I'm really excited to sort of take this forward um, and get a group and sort of a nutrition uh, task force together to try to really create change within um, our medical schools. So right now I'm going to take you through um, just a few 
of the innovative nutrition focused programs that we already have at medical schools around the country or that are already in place. Um, so while I go through this, if you see your school or if you um, if you if you're familiar with a program, feel free to raise your hand, which I think is a button accessible to you, um, and then we can we can get a feel for um, how these programs have reached. Okay. Um, so the first one I want to talk about is Northwestern University. Um, the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine at Northwestern has a culinary medicine program. And it's a pretty cool program because um, it provides, it has a elective that medical students can take there that um, through they, they have an integrative medicine education track. Um, and they actually encourage their students within that track to take this course, but it's open to all um, and any of their medical students. So it's mostly first and second years that take it, but it's also open to third and fourth for that elective credit. Um, and, it's, and their goal is to expand students' comfort in counseling patients um, on successful behavior change. So trying to, trying to really create those connections so that um, medical students feel equipped to be able to actually go out and talk, talk about this kind of thing with their future patients. Um, so the first half of the course that they provide is based in the classroom. So it's like hands-on and classroom learning about nutrition as well as cooking and culinary technique. Um, and then kind of interesting is that the second half is a service learning program that administers a nutrition education program that they've established within Chicago public school, public school classrooms. So pretty cool program over in Northwestern. Um, and then next is Tulane, which um, I think you could argue is probably the most famous culinary med medicine program um, in the country right now. They've been featured on NBC News, NPR, um, so they've got a lot of reach with the Goldring Center for Culinary Medicine at Tulane. Um, so this is actually the first dedicated teaching kitchen to be implemented at a medical school. Um, and they have a few different programs that they administer for um, for different medical students. So they have an eight class culinary medicine elective for first and second years. Um, but the cool thing is that they also have a rotation elective for third and fourth year students that not only Tulane medical students can participate in, but also students from visiting schools, which is pretty cool. Um, and it, they discuss nutrition concepts, meal planning, culinary techniques. They also have a volunteer component with community-based cooking classes. Um, and it really encourages interprofessional education. So the, pro the program is put together with the help of and incorporating um, chefs, physicians, dietitians, as well as the students that they're teaching. Um, and there's been some data collected um, from this, so they have some outcomes data. Um, one is that so every student that goes through this program through a class or through a rotation takes the 55 questions survey after their course, um, and they found that medical students who have been through this program are two and a half to three times as likely to understand these concepts and talk about them with their patients than students who don't go through a program of, of this nature. And they, so, that, so they're really showing that, um, that what they're doing is working and that they're, you know, being able to talk to students about nutrition is, is genuinely helpful um, for the future. And um, they've actually implemented this curricula. Um, in 15 different medical schools. So it's, so it's growing, which is exciting. Um, and then there are a few other types of programs. One is, um, I just want to give a quick example um, of something going on that's student-based um, in a medical school. So Boston University has um, the Student Nutrition Awareness and Action Council, which is a student group, um, brought about in 2009 due to, and it was just founded by students who were able to recognize they recognize the lack of nutrition education in their curriculum, and they just got together with faculty members and dietitians to, to really try to bring this to the university's attention and create this student group to, to sort of create change within their school. Um, so now they have a demo kitchen at Boston Medical Center. Um, they host lunch talks with different experts, um, nutrition experts that they bring in. Um, they talk about the intersection of um, nutrition and food justice and advocacy by holding an annual SNAP challenge. 
Um, and right now they're working to create um, a comprehensive nutritional elective that will be available to students. So, so just a cool example of um, a student-based initiative that, um, that was created sort of from the ground up and that is still, still being used to try to create lasting change within Boston University. Um, so next is the University of Arizona, which is um, also kind of famous for its Center for Integrative Medicine. So this is a center um, that focuses on several different modalities. So they do focus a lot on nutrition, but they also incorporate things like um, homeopathy, osteopathy, and different mind-body approaches. Um, and so they have a few, different, a few different programs. They have the Integrative Medicine in Residency, which is a 200-hour online curriculum designed um, for incorporation into primary care residency programs, and that's actually been implemented in many family medicine residencies around the country, as well as residencies in internal medicine um, and a couple other specialties as well. And they have a whole list on their website, so you could go look at that. Um, so they actually also provide a month-long elective rotation for fourth-year medical students. So they, they do have something where, uh, where medical students can come and spend a month learning about integrative medicine, and, and nutrition is a, is a big part of that. Um, and then, and this isn't really um, like an elective or, or residency kind of program, but Harvard actually um, has their School of Public Health as well, as well as their medical school has collaborated to create this sort of annual conference for physicians, dietitians, nurses, healthcare professionals, hospital executives, chefs, and food service directors to all kind of come together just to talk about the current research on diet, nutrition, and lifestyle choices um, for professionals who want to learn um, and implement this in their practice. So this is just kind of to show that, that uh, lots of different schools are getting on board um, and really pushing the importance of nutrition and recognizing that. And then finally, the last thing that I wanted to touch on is the University of North Carolina's um, Chapel Hill's Nutrition in Medicine Project. Um, you may or may not have heard of this, but it, it's been around for a while. It began in 1995 um, to, to sort of create um, nutrition curriculums for medical schools. Um, they, in 1995, they created CD-based nutrition curricula that they took to each school. Um, and today they provide online modules of evidence-based clinical nutrition education um, for students, residents, fellows as well as um, practicing physicians. And so if you haven't had a chance to check out um, the NIM modules, you should, you really should, because there's, there's a lot and they're, um, they're free to use and very informative. Um, they're, they, they're based on case studies, so it really, they really do a good job um, of showing how to actually apply nutrition, evidence-based nutrition to clinical practice. Um, yeah, so these are just a few programs that are going on around the country, just to kind of give you an idea of um, what's, what's, what's happening right now. There are, are probably lots more, but I just wanted to give you kind of a taste of what's happening. So yeah, thanks. We'll turn it over to Constance. Hello? Hi, Constance, we can hear you. Hi. Hi. <laughs> OK, great. Um, so I'm Constance Lee, and I'm a fourth-year medical student right now at Rowan School of Osteopathic Medicine, and I'm also a former intern at TCRM, um, which is a great opportunity for medical students, by the way. Okay, so uh, I'm here to talk about how um, I had my personal journey in kind of getting my medical school to finally start talking about plant-based nutrition. Um, as uh, people have said before, there's really not too much um, talk about nutrition in medical schools these days, which is a shame. So we kind of have to be the pioneers uh, of this movement. Okay, so the first thing that you do, uh, and I'm going to try to make this um, a little bit more interactive so you guys can develop uh, like a rough action plan um, by the end of this. So the first thing that I did was find other vegans and vegetarians and allies in my school. Uh, so in my first year of medical school, I started gathering all these um, people in my group to like grow this momentum. Um, 
I found people that were vegetarian, and you can see that on the left picture. I found two vegetarians in the school in my first week, and we um, we got a table at the orientation week. So we got to advertise to everybody like, hey, we just started this group. It was called the Medical Vegetarian Society. Um, and then once you have your core group, you can start having social gatherings. You can um, do things like recognize people's birthdays. Um, and there's a picture on the right where, where people like surprised me with a cake. It was a vegan cake too. So it was like both promoting um, plant-based nutrition and also like having fun. And we also did that for like other members of the group as well. Um, and then uh, another thing was that we included, we wanted our group to be as big and as effective as possible. So um, we didn't shun people based on what their eating habits were. Um, some of my best e-board members, they ate meat. And that was okay because they worked hard in the club and they, they made it really great. Um, and it showed people that we were open-minded and inclusive. Um, so the first thing I want to, you to write down in your action plan, you can either type this or get out a piece of paper, is think about some of your classmates who can be allies for you in trying to get nutrition into the school. And it doesn't necessarily have to be like changing the curriculum. It can be just being out there and like being seen, it's starting a dialogue. So I'll give you um, like, 10 seconds to just like really off the top of your head, write down people that you think would be interested. And they can even be like your good friends. Um, a large portion of my group were just people that were close to me. Um, and it would, we would just bake while we were hanging out and we'd do like vegan bake sales the next day. And write down like any vegans or vegetarians in your class that you know. Okay, all right, I'm gonna move on, but you guys can work on that list later. Okay, so the second thing that we did was um, we were very visible. So once you have your group, then you can start, um, I guess this kind of goes hand in hand, you just start making yourselves uh, known and seen. So one of the things that I did was I tried to introduce the terminology of plant-based and vegan vegetarian into the school. Um, a lot of people don't even know about the term plant-based and I think it's a it's a very good term when we're trying to describe vegetarian diets because sometimes when people hear vegetarian or vegan they automatically get turned off. So plant-based is much more uh, scientific. If you want to be really specific you say plant-based whole foods. Um, I thought plant-based was really catchy. Uh, so we had that, um, we said that as much as possible. We put on our posters. Um, I had this bumper sticker that someone put on their car and I put it on my laptop so everyone would see the words um, when we were just in class. Uh, when you have events, um, like we would have potlucks on a regular basis and we would have them in a room in the school. So we would just like hang up signs saying like, oh, med veg potluck, free food, and it would catch people's attention and it would just start to become more and more of like a natural part of the culture of the school. Like everyone knew that we had these potlucks. Um, let's see, what else? Oh, another thing that we did, and you can see that on the bottom, is what we started an organic garden uh, on school grounds and it was right at the entrance, so everyone has to see it when they're walking into the school. Um, and I don't have a final picture here, but you could probably look it up online, Rowan SOM Garden, Community Garden. And we basically had like a huge day where everyone just like laid down fertilizer and planted seeds and made the beds. And we had this like big ribbon cutting ceremony. And it was, it attracted a lot of attention and it was very positive. And then once we started growing things, people would see it, um, every day there's like lots of flowers and like vegetables growing. So it was a lot of positive press for us. And it made us seem like a fun group too. 
uh, which is my next point, is to uh, have fun. Um, if you are having fun, like, it's sad to say, but it sometimes doesn't even matter what you're marketing. Um, people want to join you. Uh, like, pe people just naturally gravitate to people who seem like they're enjoying what they're doing. Um, so don't make it all about business. Just make it, make it a fun social movement. Um, and one of, the, one of the best ways to do that is to involve food in all of your events. That definitely attracts a lot of people and makes them happy. Okay, so you had a lot of fun and you're kind of making a small splash at the school. So what do you do then? Uh, well, for me, at this point was the time when I could start to pull in administrators um, to get involved in our movement. And so, um, like, sometimes they would just naturally gravitate towards me. I think that was the best way to do it. Uh, or you could, like, ask around, see which professors are really interested in nutrition, see which uh, faculty members are vegetarian, and, like, approach them. Uh, but mostly, um, I had faculty come up to me like during one of our potlucks or one of our film screenings, and they would say like, oh, I really love what you're doing. Like, I think we need to talk about this more in medical school. And then we'd be like, oh, okay, like, that's great. Like, we really appreciate that. Um, by the way, we're having this event later, like, and we really need a speaker, and it would be amazing if you could come speak for us. Um, and then, like, usually they would say yes, and then they would start to get personally involved in the movement, and then they can become your advocates later on when you want to have a more formal integration of nutrition into the medical school. So um, at this point, go back to your action plan, and if you can think of any, I know this might be like kind of unfamiliar because you don't typically talk to administrators about what their diets are, um, but if you can think of any faculty members that would be open to having these conversations and open to getting involved in plant-based nutrition, just write them down. And I'll give you a second for that. Okay, and I'm gonna move on. Okay, sorry, there's a lot of text on this slide. Um, so um, we kind of went over some of this before. You identify who can be your allies and who is most excited um, about your ideas. Like they don't necessarily need to be the person in the most amount of power. Um, they just need to have enthusiasm. If you, ha if you like target the um, curriculum um, if you, like, try to get the curriculum coordinator to work with you um, and they're, like, not that enthusiastic, um, you're not going to be that great off. Like, better to get a, a resident who's, like, really enthusiastic to, like, start talking about it and, like, start pitching the idea to the curriculum committee. Um, okay. And some ideas about how you could integrate uh, nutrition talks formally into the, the school's education curriculum um, is you could look at the different blocks that they have. I know some schools do subject blocks, some do blocks by systems, um, but here I just have listed a couple of the ideas for where um, nutrition talks can fit in pretty well with various subjects or systems. Um, so you could target, like, some of these professors. Like, personally, I had a physiology professor who was um, really on board with all of this, and we got her to speak at a screening for Forks Over Knives, and she agreed to talk about plant-based nutrition in her GI lectures on physiology. Um, we, think we offered for her to use the slides provided for provided by Physicians Committee, um, but she preferred to use her own slides, and she actually developed 
original slides just for the talk. Um, and you know, that's, that's her prerogative. And basically the core lesson is you just need to be open and flexible about what your allies can provide to you. Um, different people are comfortable doing different things and have like different positions of power or resources to do different things. And like what you end up doing at your school may look totally different from what I ended up doing at my school just because the circumstances and the people are different. So just be open to it. Um, another idea is if you, if your professors are like, oh my God, like I have so much material to teach in the first two years in basic science, like I can't fit anything else into it, which is usually a problem. And plus nobody's really paying attention because everyone's busy studying for boards. Um, you can fit it into the clinical rotations where people are a little bit more relaxed and um, the lectures are mandatory generally. Uh, so I thought that it would fit really well with some of these primary, uh, primary care rotations, but it can really be any rotation as long as you have an advocate in that department that is really enthusiastic. Um, yeah, and then here I have just listed a couple of other uh, ideas on how you could introduce nutrition into the medical school that aren't um, just based on the curriculum. At my school, we started Nutrition Curriculum Task Force, too, and we invited um, some students to sit on it as well. So that worked really well for us. Mm, inviting guest lecturers. Uh, one time I invited Dr. Barnard to speak, and that was, um, that, that was very, very popular among the students. It drew a lot of attention. Okay. And um, so on your action plan, think about it along the rest of the talk. and. Think about what what methods would be most uh, achievable for you, what you're most comfortable with, what you think that um, is the lowest hanging fruit for you to grab onto. Okay? And good luck. Thank you so much, Constance. Um, we appreciate you uh, sharing your story with us. And I'd like, yeah. Uh, and so this is Francesca. Um, I'd like to go over the, what resources the Physicians Committee has to support you along the way. So the three big resources that we have, my favorite, um, are here. All of our resources are evidence-based, and I'm going to go through each one individually so we can talk about them. So you heard about the Nutrition and Medicine modules from Joe. Uh, the University of North Carolina has created them, their evidence-based clinical nutrition education program. And we teamed up with them to create a few um, series, a, a short series of uh, quick and informative modules on plant-based nutrition for the treatment and prevention of type 2 diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, and obesity. Uh, in the Nutrition in Medicine website also has other nutrition modules as well. And your professor can actually assign these modules to students, or you could do them on your own. They're totally free. Uh, I'll show you the website a little bit later. And about half of the medical schools in the country already use NIM modules in some way, so it's a really well-known resource. And their website is right here. So it's something you can share with your professors, and they could add in the plant-based modules or some of the other nutrition modules. Um, but we'll send this out in the follow-up email as well. Uh, if we met at the AMSA conference, then you've probably heard about our PowerPoint lectures. Um, we've designed four lectures on evidence-based eating patterns that can be adopted at your school, and this is what Constance was uh, talking about just a moment ago. So these topics include heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, and weight control. Uh, because they're short, they're only 15 to 20 minutes, they can be easily slipped into other lectures on these topics, unless you have a professor that wants to create their own. Um, but if they don't, then they can add these, and uh, they are all evidence-based and have the references right on there. So it's easy for when schools lack the time to add 
entire nutrition courses or add even just additional lectures. Um, the PowerPoints are really beautiful. These are some slides from them. They bring the, the information to life with these pretty images like that. Uh, they also are um, short and include citations for all of the data that they reference, like this chart here. Um, we do have a video of Dr. Barnard, who's the president and founder of the Physicians Committee, giving the diabetes PowerPoint, um, so you can see what it looks like. Uh, what you don't see here is that we made notes for each PowerPoint slide, so professors can actually just read the information. They don't have to make it up <laughs> as they go along. Um, and we've got that whole video at this link, which we'll send out um, in the follow-up email. But, so you could send your professors the video, or you could just watch it for yourself to learn more. That way you can see how the lectures come to life. All right. Okay, so I'm going to ask uh, it, for you to raise your hand if you've ever received one of these guides. You can raise your hand by going to the person at the top of your screen that has the hand raised. Um, all right, I see some people have got their hands raised. That's great. So the Nutrition Guide for Clinicians is a comprehensive, portable medical reference manual. It's the perfect book to reference when you're meeting with a patient. It covers nearly 100 diseases and conditions, including risk factors, diagnoses, and methods of treatment. It describes nutrition's role in disease prevention, and you can find helpful tips for discussing dietary changes with patients. Um, we're also proud to share that the guide is evidence-based, of course, but also free of commercial sponsorship, which can be really useful uh, if you try to get these into your class. Um, so we do offer nutrition guides to all first and second year medical students in the U.S. and Canada, completely free, and we're, we send them out to about 70 medical schools, and that's about 10,000 medical students a year already receive them, so you're in good company if you've got them. However, we would like to grow this number as much as possible, so if you haven't, if you don't have a copy personally, um, or if you want your schools to receive copies, just uh, in the Q&A box at the bottom right hand of your screen, just let me know, type it in, and I'll follow up after the presentation to get in touch with you, either to give you a personal one or get enough that you can share them with your fellow students. Um, we're also really excited that we're coming out with a new edition in early 2018. This edition still has a lot of amazing information, but uh, it'll be fun to have a new one to share soon. Okay, so now we have all of these great resources. What are we supposed to do with them? How do you convince your professor to use them? And Constance has said, has said some of this. So just a little review. You want to find your stakeholders, find others who are interested in nutrition to help push it along. Uh, that might mean to start a club, like Constance said, to help build momentum. And there might already be one on campus. Uh, we, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine interest groups are active across the country, and the ACLM, American College of Lifestyle Medicine, is the professional medical association for physicians and other health professionals um, that are devoted to advancing the mission of lifestyle medicine. Um, if there isn't a group already, you can find a few friends like Constance did who are interested in plant-based nutrition and host a meeting. And I'm sure you heard in Constance's talk that she did a lot of stuff with food. We have found that free food is the golden ticket to getting people to attend events. Um, and, you know, luckily we have all of you here with us, even though it's online and we don't have food to give you. <laughs> uh, but you can meet together to discuss next steps, like who the best administrator is to approach. If you didn't write anybody down um, on your list earlier, then maybe you can find a friend who might have an idea. You could host a speaker, or you could also host a film screening. Um, you could even give away free nutrition guides if you like. Um, the other option is to have some faculty help. And I think it's important to remember that when surveyed, 79% of medical school instructors believe that students need more nutrition instruction. So you have faculty at your school who are interested in nutrition. You have faculty who are interested in plant-based nutrition. You just have to get out there and find them, like Constance said. Um, 
Also, hearing your thoughts on the importance of nutrition in education could inspire them or maybe fan the flame of their interest. Uh, one of the easiest things to do is ask a friendly faculty member to add some nutrition into lectures that they're already giving. And we have those PowerPoints that can be really useful for them there so they don't have to do a lot of extra work. You could also ask them to hand out copies of the nutrition guide to their class. Um, if your entire school doesn't want them for everyone, they could, even, they could just do it per class, or they could work to get them out to everyone. Okay, so those are my ideas, and we're going to talk about next steps. Um, you've got your stakeholders written down from before. You've got some administrators, hopefully, that you're, or professors that you can go to. So maybe some ideas are starting to circulate. So let's uh, go ahead and decide the first action that you're going to take to get this off the ground. Um, you can write it on the paper that you've already taken out, and then I would love if you would take a moment to share it with us, and we, we have a little poll box that's coming up, and you can actually type it in and share it with everyone so people can learn from your ideas. Um, and so that'll be open in just a, a moment for you to do. So go ahead and think of what is that first thing you're going to do to get your nutrition plan off the ground. Uh, I'd also love to hear where you could see our resources working at your school. So where would these PowerPoints fit in? Where would the nutrition, gu nutrition guides fit in? Do you think the NIM modules would be useful? We'd love to hear that. We're going to open up a little poll there so you can type in where you think you'd use them, whether it's uh, talking to a professor or uh, bringing them to your club or something, or just using them on your own, or another idea that would be wonderful. So go ahead and think about that, and you can let us know, and we'll broadcast those results too. And I see a few answers coming in, so I'm going to get those broadcasted. Okay. So someone is interested in starting a student interest group task force, contact a faculty member. Those are the first actions we're going to take. That's great. So uh, keep Typing in, and I'm going um, just to share a couple more things. Uh, we're excited to, I love that you use the word task force there. Uh, we're excited to share that we're starting a medical student nutrition task force at the Physicians Committee. Um, the idea is that we will play a bigger role in helping you get your nutrition education plan off the ground. So we can offer guidance, you can learn from each other, from your peers, and you can share um, what would be helpful to have from us, the Physicians Committee. So if you're interested in um, joining us, we're going to start that uh, next week. Um, we'll just do a, a brief call together. We have a couple of times option, options for time. If you're interested, you can in the Q&A box, again, just let me know that you're interested, if you have a specific uh, day that works better for you, and I'll follow up with you to get you all of that information to move forward. So, um, all right, seeing some good answers coming in, forming a similar club as the Student Nutrition Awareness and Action Committee, that's good. Uh, resources fitting in, hopefully in the curriculum, um, and reaching out to GI blocks, that's good. All right, thanks for sharing that, and keep on adding answers as you like. Um, I would really like to thank all of you for spending your limited free time with us here today. We are going to use the last few minutes for some Q&A, so if you have some questions lingering, feel free to um, add those in, and I'll make some room for you to see the Q&A box there. Um, but I will go ahead and start our first question. And our first question is for Dr. Loomis. And the question is, can plant-based nutrition be incorporated into other specialties? Well, I think that, um, you know, one of the things you come to realize, I think in med school we're oftentimes taught to, because, because our whole healthcare system operates in this kind of treatment mode, you know, we're taught in med school to think about how do I lower someone's blood pressure, how do I help people lose weight, how do I treat their irritable bowel syndrome? How do I get their blood sugar down? But if you really think about it and, and you flip that question upside down and, and ask the question, why is someone's blood pressure high? Or why is their cholesterol high? Or why do they have IBS? Or, or why are they obese? The answer to those questions are oftentimes the same. And it's, it's really rooted in this kind of uh, this, 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 this discordant lifestyle that we, that we lead. And so 
really the focusing on, and, and arguably diet drives 80, 90 percent of the risk for many of these chronic diseases. I mean, clearly there's a little bit of a genetic risk, but take colon cancer, for example. You know, 90 percent of the risk for colon cancer is, 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 is environmental and mainly food. So there's a huge role for this because it, it really, that's the beauty of focusing on things like plant-based nutrition because when you get people to eat right, you get them to exercise, it really is, it, it, it helps people's health be helpful across all disciplines. Um, and, and it's, you know, it, it, it leads to a fundamentally different way to think about how we approach chronic disease and help people be helpful. Thank you, Dr. Lynn. Um, Constance, we had a question about how you can afford all of the events for the student group. Could you talk about funding opportunities for it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, uh, this is great because um, it's something that I forgot to cover in my lecture. So, um, I got, so my, my group was new and for my school we have this probationary period for new clubs where we can't get school funding for a good two years. So the first two years, we kind of had to scrap together the money ourselves. Um, and we uh, mostly got the funding from this place called vegfund.org. Uh, where can I type that for people? Oh, that's a great uh, question. I'll put a little notepad out with that. What if I submit it on this, like, <laughs> Uh -huh. But and I can also email it to everyone. Okay. Anyways, it's called vegfund.org um, with no dashes in it. And um, basically, it's this group that has uh, like a foundation. And specifically, they are um, they they take your applications for like ideas that you want to do for events. Like they. Um, we used it for our film screening of Forks Over Knives, so they, they paid for our license to show the movie, which was kind of insane. It was like $200. Um, and yeah, and they paid for like all of our food as long as it's completely vegan, and we try as much as possible to make everything um, like biodegradable and like environmentally friendly. So it's kind of an expensive application, but it's worth it in the end because they almost always uh, grant you the money for it. Um, so you just like spend the money, keep the receipts, and then you submit the receipts to them in the end, and they uh, write you a check to reimburse you and all of your members. So yeah, that one was really useful for when we were on probation. Thank you. That's really helpful, Constance. Um, mm -hmm. And I have a question for the group. So whoever wants to jump in and answer, that would be great. So the question is, how do you contend with the pushback uh, based on the assumption that making a diet change is too big of a change for patients and not realistic? Maybe, Dr. Loomis, you want to talk about your experience with the Barnard Medical Center? Sure. You know, in my experience, and I think it's borne out in some research, some of the research that, that we've done here at PCRM around diabetes, that, that um, it's there was a study, an NIH-funded study that was done a number several years ago, where we compared, um, uh, took type two diabetics and put half on the standard ADA diet and the other half um, on plant-based diet, and like 90% were still compliant at the end of the, the, the two-year period. And I, I think it just speaks to the fact that that um, because, for example, my, my my own personal experience. The profound changes you experience when you really start to eat healthy, uh, the increase in energy and the weight loss and the mood and your mental clarity and getting rid of the brain fog and on and on and on it is so profound that I think it's self-motivating. And not only that, the food tastes great, right? So um, in my experience, people, once they engage and kind of get over the hump, and typically it's three or four months, most people will, will be all in. Um, and, and many become actually uh, evangelical champions uh, for, for plant-based nutrition. It, it's interesting how many people want to, I want to help you. I want to get out and talk to people because it's so amazing. I'm not taking all these drugs anymore. And on and on. So I, I think that it becomes self-sustaining if you can get people over the hump. And it does take work in the short run. We offer all of our patients a, 12, a free 12-week class around plant-based nutrition that addresses uh, many different aspects from how to shop and read labels 
how, how to overcome some of the psychological barriers to change to, um, um, uh, and some of the basic science around uh, how plant-based uh, uh, diets are helpful. And, and that creates kind of a group a groupness uh, around that, and I, that, I think that's really helpful as well in that while people are going through that change process uh, to, to, to get that social support amongst each other. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Lewis. Okay. And Joe, we have a question for you. Uh, I see your title is Medical Student Nutrition Task Force Lead. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, <laughs> So since I'm with PCRM for a little bit of time, um, I'm helping with an initiative to try to get some students like all of you um, and me starting this fall together um, to try to just create um, a kind of community where we can talk about what we're trying at our schools, where we can figure out what works, where we can um, you know, be able to communicate with the physician's committee for support and for resources um, as, as necessary. So I'm looking forward to being able to, to sort of help us spearhead that um, and create a forum where we can hopefully create change. Thanks, Joe. All right, well, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And thank you, all of the speakers, for, for coming together. Really appreciate it. Um, I know we didn't get to all of the questions, but we'll, we have them, so we'll respond to them. Uh, and we really appreciate you taking the time to join us. Um, we'll be in touch soon with a link to the recording of this, so you can share it with friends if you found it helpful. Um, and so you can just refer back to it as much as you need. And we'll send out links to everything we talked about today. So thank you so much, and have a lovely day. <laughs>